Why, hello, everybody. How are you doing today? So we're going to do something a little differently today, but you know that. You saw the thumbnail. You read the title. You didn't click on this video blindfolded, right? You know what the deal is. I feel like I don't even have to make the rest of this intro. You know what's going on, you know? So, uh, what, what, what you want to talk about? Uh, the, the Jews are having a real rough time of it, huh? So how this video is going to work is going to be basically the exact opposite of what I usually do, which essentially take a character and stick them into a really fucked up location and see if they can survive. This one isn't necessarily going to be about survival, but instead I'm going to take four different like all powerful conqueror, warlord, emperor type characters who want to dominate and control and subjugate and murder. And I'm going to throw them into Eternia. Well, not Eternia, but the He-Man universe as a whole and see if they can conquer this new universe that they find themselves in. Conquer, eradicate, subjugate, destroy, whatever it is they're into. Can they do it to the universe that is the masters of the universe? And that's really it. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. If you enjoy the video, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, share, and join the membership. If you join the membership, you will get videos early, but I have wasted enough of your time. Let's get started. So I suppose this is the part of the video where I have to explain to you exactly what our conquerors have to overcome in order to conquer the universe that is masters of the universe and i suppose i cannot use the excuse that i used last time that everyone knows everything about john wick so i don't have to explain it because i imagine there might be like two people watching this video that actually knows shit about he-man so uh yeah i'm not gonna lie this is usually my my least favorite part of the video but there is a bright side because i get to do one of my favorite things shit on versus battle wiki so let's go over to our good friends and find out exactly what they have to say fucking course it's multiversal plus of course it is who isn't and why is it multiverse because of the star seed are you serious versus battle week can you at least make it difficult for me to make fun of you give me like some kind of challenge i mean fuck this is starting to get boring so just to clarify the reason why versus battle wiki is unbelievably wrong here is because the star seed is an artifact that is implied heavily to have created the entire multiverse of the masters of the universe Universe, which is stated to be infinite. So obviously He-Man destroying the Star Seed proves that he is multiversal plus because that can produce multiversal plus levels of energy and you, you get the idea. Um, no, for a couple reasons. What evidence exists that the Star Seed has multiversal plus levels of durability? It's a little magical artifact that he smashes. What proof? is there that it can withstand that amount of force. So even if it was true that something that contains a certain amount of energy has to have equivalent durability to the energy it produces, which by the way, it isn't necessarily, this is a magical artifact. It's not an energy source. It's not electricity or nuclear energy. It's fucking magic. Magic inherently breaks the laws of physics, of reality, of all that different kind of shit. How many movies and books and shows and cartoons and all sorts of forms of media have you seen where there's an all-powerful magical artifact that could fit in your fucking pocket and be smashed on the ground? How many times have you seen that? Probably countless, right? Because it's a magical artifact. There's no evidence that the artifact has to be of equivalent durability. Also, the whole story of the Star Seed is about Skeletor trying to acquire it so he can get this massively multiversal power and basically dominate the entire multiverse. At a point in that story, Skeletor gets it and He-Man gets it and they both get massive power-ups. If both of them are already multiversal plus because they're capable of destroying the star seed, then what would be the fucking point of the story of them trying to acquire it the whole time? Clearly they don't have that level of power without it, otherwise it wouldn't have been a plot point for them to acquire it. And lastly, He-Man has so many different continuities and versions of the story across all forms of media from TV shows to web comics to regular comics. Even the action figures have their own lore that come with it in these little sort of mini books. And across all that media that's existed since 1983, the Star Seed has appeared exactly once in one story, in one comic, and gets destroyed pretty much immediately after creation. Most continuities don't even have a fucking Star Seed and they don't explain how the multiverse was created. Most continuities don't even talk about a multiverse. So you scaling assholes are gonna hold the entire universe up to a single issue of a single comic and say that that is the power of He-Man 
Batman and Skeletor and She-Ra and all these characters based on a single comic in a universe that has existed for over 40 years. You see, this is why people make fun of you guys. The thing that you claim to do and be awesome at, you fucking suck at it. You are truly atrocious. You all seem like a bunch of insecure children playing in a park, all arguing that your invisible space gun is the most powerful invisible space gun out of all the other little kids' invisible space guns. And then getting these long drawn out arguments about it over fucking nothing. It's fiction. That means not true. Stop embarrassing yourselves. So now that Versus Battle Wiki has been sufficiently bullied, how strong are we going to say that the He-Man universe is? And I mean, it's really fucking strong, guys. Like, it's okay if a universe just blows up a planet. That's fine. That's a perfectly reasonable power level. Not every single fictional universe has to be multiversal. There's a lot of good stories that aren't multiversal, you know? That 70s show, The Sopranos, Jerry Springer's Baggage, you know? All perfectly adequate television. So I'm not gonna list everything that exists within the He-Man universe because, oh my God, it is so much bigger than you could possibly imagine. It's it's massive. And it's kind of crazy because it's not Marvel, right? It's not like this massive, massive multiverse, but I feel like it would take longer to explain. It's really only two planets and both of these planets exist within the same solar system. That's it. There are other things in the universe outside of those planets, but they only become relevant once they land on one of these two planets. Outside of that, nothing fucking matters. But despite that, these planets have so much fucking shit on them. So the basics that everyone should basically know is that you have Eternia, which is one planet, and it's ruled by King Randor, and there's this interdimensional skull face sorcerer that comes to Eternia for the sole purpose of conquering it, and Prince Adam is chosen by this sorceress known as the Sorceress, yeah, in order to become a hero to defend the planet of Eternia against the skull face sorcerer, and he becomes He-Man, and that's the story on a very, very basic level. That does not account for Preternia, Subternia, Etheria, all of the many different races. You know there's a race of beings in He-Man that are literal meteors that turn into animals? Like, that's their whole thing. They're kind of like Transformers, but they turn from animals into meteors, and then they can fling themselves at things like meteors and cause meteor levels of damage. That's a whole race of beings. What crack addict came up with that fucking idea? Like, that's a nutty idea. There's a whole race of rock men. There's a fucking religious cult that's obsessed with turning themselves into robots. There's a group of alien invaders known as the Snake Men who serve this dark god who land on the planet to conquer Eternia, who's already conquered several galaxies that we never see. And he's ruled by King Hiss, and King Hiss is like this weird, like, amalgamation of man legs, but also a bunch of snake parts that come out of the waist. And he uses all kinds of crazy dark magic and shit, but then there's also continuities where he's basically the DNA of all the greatest warriors in the universe all combined into one person and then turned into a snake for some reason. This shit is nuts. Like, it would take me an hour to go over everything that's just on Eternia, not including Etheria, which has She-Ra and Hordak. And that's a whole other can of worms. Can, can of beans? Can of, what's it saying? I don't, I don't, I don't know saying. So instead of going over every single little thing that exists within this universe, I'm just gonna go over some of the major things and some of the biggest challenges that people are going to run into when they arrive. Biggest challenge, obviously, is going to be He-Man. He-Man is strong as shit. So he He-Man's whole thing is that he's an unbelievably amazing warrior. That's one thing. Like, he's the greatest warrior to have ever lived. Another thing is his massive, massive levels of strength. Like, he was able to push the moon out of orbit to alter the tides. He's been able to stop tornadoes by just gesturing towards them, and the physical strength causes massive whirlwinds that just eliminates the tornado from existence. He's fast as fuck, able to block lasers and react to shit that's being shot at him from space. He gets there in, like, the blink of an eye, and he just dodges it like it's no big deal. But the most important thing and the real reason why he just can't be defeated outside of his incredible strength is the Sword of Power. Not only does it bestow his strength to him and allow him to bestow strength onto others, which is super useful that he doesn't use nearly as much as he probably should, it's also completely indestructible and completely negates any form of attack if he uses it to block. It doesn't matter what the attack is, whether it's physical, reality warping, magical, doesn't matter. If He-Man raises his sword, and blocks the path of whatever the attack is, it's not going to get through the sword and actually affect He-Man at all. He can literally survive anything that's thrown at him as long as he blocks it with his sword, even things that are usually not blockable. So for instance, telekinesis. Like let's say somebody wanted to like crush his heart 
right? Now this wouldn't normally be a projectile and wouldn't normally need to pass through anything. But if he lifts his sword up in between where the telekinesis is coming from and his own body, it will negate the usage of that telekinesis. The sword of power is essentially the ultimate shield and ultimate sword rolled into one. And this sword and He-Man's ability to use it is pretty much the only thing that's kept Eternia from being completely fucking conquered by Skeletor. Because outside of that, Skeletor is the most powerful thing in the entirety of the He-Man universe by a massive, massive margin. There are a ton of sorcerers in the He-Man universe. I mean, you have Hordak, you have the sorcerers, you have a literal god who created the Sword of Power and Attorney and all of that. And none of them are shown to really come anywhere near Skeletor's magical ability. He is an interdimensional being that comes from another universe outside of the universe that Attorney is from. And because of that, he brings all sorts of forms of magic that just straight up don't exist in this universe. Basically, throughout all the different continuities with Skeletor, he can essentially do anything he wants to do. He can transform people into shit, he can control time, he can control space. He can create life by summoning creatures, not summoning them from another world, just straight up creating them from scratch. Like he has life creation. He created his own lair. He will create minions for himself that will serve him to their dying breath. If you can think of something that can be done with magic and fiction, chances are Skeletor has done it or can do it. People really don't give Skeletor enough credit, but he is one of the strongest sorcerers in fiction, just by the sheer variety of abilities that he has. And unlike a lot of sorcerers who require all kinds of different shit in order to do it, like they require artifacts and all that different kind of stuff, he doesn't need anything. He can do it with his bare hands, he can use his staff, or he doesn't have to use his staff. He just does things. The only thing that's really limiting him is the scale of his magic. His magic cannot affect entire multiverses without something to amplify his power. As far as what he can do within the range of power that he has, it's basically limitless. And this is a lot of the reason why He-Man is so fucking broken, because pretty much every single of these near limitless types of magic that he's used, he's used on He-Man, and He-Man has been able to, in some way, counter them. Because pretty much none of that shit can affect the sword of power. And even He-Man himself can generally overcome most of what Skeletor can do, even kind of without the sword. Like, for instance, at one point, Skeletor created a cage, and this cage was stated to be created out of a magical material that completely ignores any type of force applied to it. It's essentially an indestructible cage. No kinetic force, fire, lightning, magic, whatever you want to say. Nothing could affect this cage as far as Skeletor stated and as far as a lot of the other characters who were locked in the cage stated. However, once He-Man was locked in the cage, he was still able to bend the bars and escape while saying something along the lines of nothing you can ever make will ever be able to hold me. Something like that to Skeletor. So what is this? Does this mean that He-Man has infinite strength? Well, that's definitely a possibility. I'm not going to jump to that conclusion. I think it's just as likely that He-Man is himself a magical being that is capable of essentially undoing magic with his bare hands. Magic by its very nature regates physics and reality, and He-Man is shown to be able to do things very similar to this. He-Man also has some very reality and physics breaking shit. It ain't just Skeletor. Also, before we continue, I should probably clear up that the pushing the moon out of orbit feet that He-Man has, it's a very casual feat, and characters who were shown to be weaker than him have significantly better feats than this. Like, for instance, Skeletor, when he was forging his staff, he was smashing it with his hammer like you do when you forge shit, and every single time the hammer collided with his staff, it was stated that multiple planets were blowing up across the universe. We don't know how many. There's a panel in the comic that shows four planets blowing up with a single hammer strike, but it could be considerably more than this. And when these planets exploded, the souls of all the people who died on these planets left the planet and were absorbed into the staff that he was creating. And even this is shown to be a pretty casual feat from Skeletor as he wasn't actually trying to destroy planets, he was just forging a staff. When it comes to the He-Man universe, we have impressive feats, but we don't have a like peak level because pretty much all of the greatest feats are done relatively easily by all the characters. When it comes to the He-Man universe, we just don't have a maximum strength level for them. Then you go below that and you have characters like Evil Lynn, easily within the top five most powerful magic users in the entire universe, probably top three or four on Eternia. Then you have Beastman, who people really like to disrespect. And that's mainly because the cartoon always had him be a dumbass whose stupidity always like 
fumbled Skeletor's plans and messed it up. But that's really mostly because it was a kid's cartoon and there were a lot of little changes and edits that were made in that cartoon from the basic lore and story to make it appeal more to children. Beastman being a fucking dumbass being one of them. But if you read the comics and the mini comics and things like that, this isn't actually the case. I mean, he's a general to Skeletor's armies and there's a reason for that. He's one of the best strategists in all of Eternia. And there's a reason why Skeletor trusts him to run that army. Not only is he a good strategist, but he's physically powerful enough to fight against He-Man. While clearly not being as strong as He-Man and pretty much always losing, he is capable of fighting against him. I mean, this dude can chuck mountains. He's a very powerful being because he himself is a master of the universe. And this is where I kind of have to get into this sort of master of the universe thing. The universe is always called masters of the universe. And the reason why that is, is because within masters of the universe, there are masters of the universe. And each of the masters of the universe has some sort of control over some aspect of the universe. And this gives each of these masters unbelievable power across the entire universe. Now, is it universal power? No, don't fucking flip your lid, okay? Scalers and versus Battle Wiki, it's it's not all that. But it generally is very impressive levels of power. For instance, Beast Man is the master of beasts. Any animal, monster, beast, dragon, whatever the fuck you want to call it, Beast Man has complete control over them. Unlimited control across the entire universe. This is also why much of Skeletor's armies are monsters and beasts. Beast Man is even shown being able to control monsters and beasts that are more powerful than him, and I'll get into that in a little bit. There's even one character in Masters of the Universe who he's a human and he has the power to transform into a robot or a monster and he has vastly different abilities depending on which one he's turned into. When he fights against Beast Man he cannot transform into a monster because Beast Man has the power to control him if he does that. Despite the fact that this character is not actually a monster but is a human that could transform into stuff and is an intelligent being with willpower and thoughts and all that different kind of stuff, it doesn't matter. Beast Man controls all beasts. It is just a rule of the universe. And that is how all the masters of the universe work. Your willpower or ability to resist mind control is not relevant to this universe because it's not mind control. He is a master of a fundamental rule of the universe. There's also Moss Man, who is considered the equal and opposite of Beast Man. A lot of people like to argue that Moss Man is like the most powerful being in the entire universe. No, he is specifically stated multiple times to be the equal and opposite of Beast Man. Their power levels are very comparable to one another. Moss Man has the power over all nature and vegetation. He can create it, he can form from it, he's made out of it. He's basically a lesser version of Swamp Thing if you've ever read DC Comics or watched anything DC related that Swamp Thing's in. That's basically Moss Man. And also, if you've seen Masters of the Universe Revelation, just ignore it. I know that Moss Man dies in that series because Skeletor just sets him on fire and he burns alive. That's not possible in the Masters of the Universe lore. That show does not follow Masters of the Universe lore. In reality, if you were to burn Moss Man, he would just appear somewhere else where there's vegetation. He will stay alive as long as there is vegetation in the world. Masters of the Universe Revelation claims to be a sequel to the original show, the Filmation show, but they're so unsimilar. There's no way it could possibly be a sequel. I mean, fuck, in Revelation, Subternia is turned into, like, hell, basically. Subternia was never hell. It's just an underground tunnel system. It's like a, a massive city within the planet of Eternia. There's, there's no connection to hell there. That's why it's called Subternia, Subterranean, Underground. Doesn't even make sense to call Hell Subternia, because it's not sub at that point, it's just another universe. They even put Scarecrow as like the devil equivalent who rules over Sub- Scarecrow is not the devil, he's just like a dude. How could anyone possibly believe that this is a sequel to the original series? They change everything. And you have characters like Merman, who's a master of the ocean, and I mean, you know Aquaman, right? He's Aquaman. He can control all sea life, he can control water, he is physically, again, powerful enough to fight against He-Man. A lot of the Masters of the Universe are powerful enough to physically fight against He-Man. So pretty much any one of these motherfuckers are like moon-pushing levels of power. There's a whole race of dragons that live on Eternia that is stated to specifically be created so that He-Man has to overcome an enemy with his mind and not his physical ability because he's not physically strong enough to fight against the leader dragon of this army. There's Fisto, who everyone makes fun of because his name is Fisto. 
and his powers and he has a big fist. But what people don't realize is that in the lore, Fisto is stated to be the second strongest person in all of Eternia, only under He-Man. That means that all of these other characters who has control over the entire oceans and could flood the world if they wanted to, or Beast Man who controls all animals, all of these different characters come second to this dude who just punches people really hard. There's Man at Arms who's a super genius who makes every single weapon that Eternia uses from flying spacecrafts, these giant cannons that are on city walls, laser weapons, all sorts of different crazy things. And he himself, as the master of arms, has knowledge and ability to use any weapon in all of existence to its maximum performance level. Basically, if it is a weapon, this man can use it better than you. Thor can wield Mjolnir for tens of thousands of years straight and master the weapon beyond all others. And master at arms, the moment he touches that weapon and picks it up, he will instantly know how to use it better than Thor can because he is the master of arms. And this is just kind of the way the universe works. All of these characters are just insanely powerful. They're shattering beings with universal levels of power across whatever they are the master of. And the crazy part is, that's only one planet. That's Eternia. We haven't even gotten into Etheria yet, which we're gonna do right now. But don't worry, it's not like we're doubling the fucking power level of the series with Etheria. Etheria is a considerably weaker planet than Eternia, it's really not even that close. A lot of people assume that She-Ra is the same power level as He-Man. No, it's been confirmed on multiple occasions. He-Man is stronger. While She-Ra does have unique powers to herself that He-Man doesn't have, overall power level definitely goes to He-Man easily. But that doesn't mean that She-Ra is a slouch. I mean, she has pushed the moon just like He-Man has. So at bare minimum, she would also be at large planet level. And just before we move on, you keep saying bullshit. The reason why pushing the moon out of orbit is large planet level is because you're fighting against gravitational pull of Earth. And it requires large planet levels of force in order to fight that level of gravitational pull. Or at least that's what scalers calculate. I don't really do math. I'm just taking their word for it for the most part. So while she has been confirmed to be physically weaker than He-Man and her weapon, unlike He-Man, doesn't have all of the crazy resistances and shit, she does have some cool abilities. Like, for instance, she has healing powers. She has the ability to heal people. Even if they're only like an inch away from death, she can heal them and bring them back from inevitable uh, um, afterlife-ness. Her weapon, unlike He-Man, has like shape-shifting abilities where it can turn to all sorts of different weapons. It can be a rope, it can be a boomerang, it can be a sword, a spear, a shield, all sorts of different things. And while I don't believe it's as indestructible as the Sword of Power, the Sword of Protection, which is what hers is called, is basically indestructible. I don't think anything's ever happened to it that has shown me that it can be destroyed. It doesn't negate all forms of magic and power like the Sword of Power does, but I mean, it's called the Sword of Protection. Obviously, it is capable of protecting her. On top of that, she has like this flying unicorn mount she can fly around on and fight people. And you, you get the basic idea. She's this really powerful warrior chick with a lot of cool weapons and abilities. But one really dumb weakness, like she's got this gem that is essentially the source of her power. And if that gem is ever broken or destroyed anyway, she loses the ability to transform into She-Ra, which, you know, kind of a big weakness. Like He-Man doesn't have a weakness like that. As long as he has the sword, he can transform into He-Man. Super simple, uncomplicated, and doesn't completely fuck him in the ass. She-Ra doesn't work that way. She's got this major weakness that her brother doesn't have. But it's also not really a stretch to say that unlike her brother He-Man, She-Ra is not the strongest person on the planet of Etheria. That would go to Hordak. And Hordak is often called the more successful Skeletor. Like Skeletor has his evil empire and his lair and everything. And he's constantly trying to take over Eternia and being stopped by He-Man. Etheria doesn't work that way. Hordak is an evil ruler over the planet of Etheria. He rules that shit. That's, that's his shit. Shit. She-Ra is in control of a small rebellion that is constantly trying to take the planet back. It's basically a reverse of Eternia. Etheria is a planet where the villains already won. And he won long before She-Ra was ever even born. And this is one of my many reasons as to why I say that Etheria is not really as strong as Eternia. In Eternia, Skeletor is like an extremely powerful being that could easily take over the planet anytime he wanted to. He just keeps running into He-Man. Skeletor is shown on more than one occasion to be more powerful than Hordak, yet Hordak has successfully run Etheria for quite some time, and She-Ra has not been able to overthrow him in the many years she's been She-Ra. She just doesn't have that level of power. Personally, I believe if you swapped out She-Ra with He-Man, He-Man would overthrow Hordak pretty quickly, and Skeletor would essentially take over the planet and defeat She-Ra. The two planets just aren't at the same level. But that doesn't mean that Hordak's not powerful. While Hordak's magic ability is nowhere near Skeletor's, like this is shown pretty clearly in a lot of different media, Hordak also 
also has a mastery over technology that Skeletor doesn't have. Skeletor doesn't fuck with like iPhones and shit. He doesn't do tech. He is a master of magic. Hordak is a master of both. To just give you an idea, if Skeletor had an S rank in magic, Hordak would have like a B plus, A minus rank in magic and technology. He is one of the best at both, but he doesn't excel beyond everybody. In fact, there are people that work under him that are actually better at technology and magic than he is. They just don't have both like he does, and he still is the most powerful person in Etheria. And another reason why you could tell pretty easily that Etheria is quite a bit weaker than Eternia is the villain. I mean, some of Shira's most dangerous villains are characters like Entrapta, who is a tech expert, which is good, but her power is that she has hair that can bind and constrain people that she controls. Not really to the same level as someone like Beastman, I don't think. Another villain she has is Catra, who is a woman who has feline-like abilities. She has razor-sharp claws, and she's really fast and agile and hard to hit, and that's, that's it. She's just like a strong cat lady. I guess she's like, Cheetah, the Wonder Woman villain, basically, but her name's Catra. I mean, you, you can see the difference here, right? The villains just aren't to the same level. At least that was until She-Ra and the Princess of Power came out. So I made a video recently about the new Batman show, and in it, I talked about how shows evolve and how things are added into new series, and then the good things are kept and put into the main lore, and the things that just doesn't work is thrown out and you never see them again. This is what happens with Batman, with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, with all sorts of different things. Well, for the longest time, Hordak was the main dude in Etheria. He was the big bad of the series. But the Netflix series She-Ra and the Princess of Power introduced this new idea called Horde Prime who, well, actually, Hordak isn't the ruler of the Horde. He's just a very high level member and the real leader is Horde Prime who is this basically intergalactic warlord who's taking over the universe outside of the solar system of Eternia and Etheria and he sent Hordak to take over this one solar system but Hordak's been stuck on Etheria for forever being held off by the rebellion and not being able to continue its invasion. And this has pissed off Horde Prime considerably. And there's like this looming threat that Horde Prime will eventually come to Etheria himself when he's just tired of waiting for Hordak to actually take it over. This is a concept that a lot of people just straight up didn't like because they believe that it disrespected Hordak, as Hordak is now just a lackey to this guy Horde Prime. This doesn't actually bother me at all because the idea of Horde Prime is pretty cool. I like the idea that there's some like looming threat out there that's coming to take over it's way more powerful than anything we've ever seen before and we've only seen just a small part of this horde army like this isn't all of it this is just a little section there's like this whole other thing out there i think it's pretty cool now originally the whole horde prime character and horde act just being a clone of horde prime that was sent over that was just a she-ra princess of power thing it was only in one show so i personally wouldn't have considered it canon but it has now been used in revelation and it is going to be used in future comics Comics, Mattel has accepted it as a part of the ongoing lore, so it is canon now that Horde Prime is actually like a thing. I can't really use Horde Prime in this challenge, mainly because we don't know anything about him or what he's capable of. Like, we know he's stronger than Hordak, so I could say that, and we know he has a massive army that's capable of taking over galaxies, not just this single solar system. But like, where does his power compare to, say, Skeletor? Is he way stronger than Skeletor, who is the current, like, most powerful threat in the entirety of the Masters of the Universe universe? I don't don't know. We just don't know how much more powerful than Hordak he is. We just know he's considerably more powerful. But I am waiting for the day that Horde Prime shows up and we get to see a Skeletor Horde Prime face off. That'll be fucking cool. It's cool shit. All right, so before we begin, a couple of arguments that I know are going to come up from He-Man fans that I'm just going to get out the way right now. First one being, some people who have seen the original He-Man cartoon may say that this is dumb because He-Man doesn't kill people. Like, he specifically goes out of his way to not harm any life. He respects and adores all life, even Skeletors, and won't kill a single person. And there's even an episode in the original cartoon where he does believe he killed people due to an illusion that Skeletor made him see, and he, like, loses his shit and almost stops becoming He-Man because he just couldn't believe that he actually killed someone. So basically, how is he going to fight against these evil forces if he's not willing to kill anybody? And that's simple. That only existed in the original Filmation cartoon because it was made for children. When the cartoon originally came out, this rule didn't exist, and parents were kind of worried. So they changed it and tried to make it more kiddie and less dark. The comics have always kept the darkness a bit and He-Man does indeed kill people. The lore has brought over the respect for life that the cartoon He-Man had. It's not like he absolutely refuses to kill people like he did in that original cartoon. If it really comes down to it, he will kill Skeletor. In fact, there have been
in certain continuities where he has. So I wouldn't worry about the whole no kill rule thing. It was really just done because it was a 1980s children's cartoon and there were very few things that were allowed to be shown in a child's cartoon. The general lore, he prefers not to kill people, but he does. So that's something you're worried about. Don't worry about it. It's not really going to come up in this video. Second argument I know I'm going to hear is crossovers. Simple. I don't utilize crossovers unless it feeds directly into the main lore. Crossovers by their very nature have both characters being completely different power levels so that they can face off against each other. I know that He-Man beat Superman in a crossover. I know he one shot the Flash. I know he's had several crossovers with DC and has matched the most powerful beings of that universe. I don't care. I'm not using it. I'm only using feats that are canonical to Masters of the Universe. And lastly, yes, I'm aware that I am using He-Man and Skeletor in their base forms. I'm not using Master of Eternity He-Man or Master of Death Skeletor, who are considerably more powerful. If I did, the outcome of these challenges would be vastly different and these characters would stand virtually no chance. I mean, Master of Eternity He-Man has complete power over destiny, fate, and time. It's just not really a fair fight at that point. I'm using all these characters at their base strength levels. That would include characters like Thanos. For instance, I'm not going to be talking about Thanos with Heart of the Universe, who becomes so goddamn powerful, he wipes out the strongest beings in all of Marvel. I'm not using that version. I'm just using regular basic bitch Thanos, regular basic bitch He-Man. So if you think I'm severely underplaying these characters, just know this is their base form, all right? All right. And yeah, there's like a lot more I could talk about. Like I haven't really talked about Scareglow, like the actual Scareglow in the lore. I haven't talked about Subternia. There's a ton of different races that exist that I haven't really talked about or gone in detail about. But I did discuss all of the major threats and the top tier shit that these Conquerors are gonna have to deal with. And I mean, really that's, ain't, ain't that enough? Ain't that, that's like, that's good, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, so first things first. Usually in these sort of challenges, I just take the character and I throw him in the world and see what happens. But I'm not doing Doing that this time because it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, these are universal conquerors who conquer universes with like armies and technology and all different kinds of crazy shit. So just sending them down to the surface of the planet with nothing but their dicks in their hands wouldn't be a very good representation of their conquering ability. So no, all of these conquerors are going to get their armies, their ships, any generals or whatever they might have. They're going to get literally everything. It's going to be an entire invasion force coming upon this solar system with Eternia and Etheria to see exactly how they go about taking over this particular solar system. And up first we have Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. That's right baby, Darth Sidious himself. And people who are used to watching my videos know that I usually order these from people who are least likely to succeed to most likely to succeed. Which means I'm gonna piss off some fucking Star Wars fans by having Palpatine be the first one I talk about. But Ruga, you don't understand. Palpatine is the strongest force user in the entire universe. In Legends, he's so powerful that he shook the cosmos and was able to shake stars and all this kind of... Yeah, I know. I read Versus Battle Wiki too. It's fucking wrong. Yes, absolutely. There is a novel where Emperor Palpatine defeats Plagueis and after killing Plagueis, the stars are said to shake. However, at no point in that story does it ever say that this is caused by Palpatine or Plagueis for that matter. What the book actually says is that the dark side itself shifts and changes once Plagueis dies. Sidious is then chosen as the new avatar for the dark side. It is the force itself that shakes the stars, not Palpatine. In fact, Palpatine on more than one occasion talks about what the strongest force ability in all of existence is it's called Force Storm. He uses this several times and it is said to be strong enough to lay waste to the surface of a planet. That's his strength level. That's his strongest ability as he himself says. Luke Skywalker also repeats this several times that Force Storm is the strongest ability that exists within the Force. I understand that scalers like to take all kinds of little feats like there's this one feat where there was this artifact that was going to shake the world apart and this one Jedi that's like a mid-level Jedi was able to stop it from happening and people are like oh that means Jedi's are planetary and get to destroy planets no they can't he used the force to stop an artifact from destroying the planet fine that doesn't mean he himself is capable of destroying the planet no Jedi or Sith is capable of destroying the planet if they were what would be the fucking point of the Death Star why would Palpatine go through three movies building two different Death 
stars that are capable of blowing up planets if he can just do it himself. He can't. He's not capable of it. No character is. Or Storm is the most power we've ever seen him use, and it devastates the surface. I don't care that if the novel's Palpatine says that the Force is stronger than any weapon that can destroy an entire system. I know he says it. Does anyone in the entirety of the Star Wars universe ever actually destroy a system with the Force? No. Maybe he's speaking metaphorically. Maybe he's just using flowery language. Maybe he's saying it's more valuable overall to their side and what they're doing than just a weapon that destroys shit. Any of that could be possible. None of it needs to be literal. But I know Scalar's gonna take that shit super literally with absolutely zero evidence showing that it is. So, taking the Palpatine with the actual feats that he has, what will he be able to do here in Eternia and Etheria? He'll be able to do a lot. Not as much as the Star Wars fans would like him to, but a decent amount. See, the strongest thing about Palpatine is not necessarily his power in the Force. It's not only his ability to manipulate people around him, but also his insane level of patience. Palpatine is very good at setting up long plans that last hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years to acquire the things that he wants to acquire. If he shows up at Eternia, he's not going to just pull up with an entire army and invade the planet because he would fucking lose. And I think he's smart enough to know that. He didn't do that when he tried to take over the entire Star Star Wars Galaxy because he knew he wouldn't be able to succeed. He'd have to fight an entire army of Jedi. Instead, he laid very specific plans so that he can sly his way into their governmental system and take it over from the inside. And that's exactly what he would attempt to do in Eternia. The question then becomes, would it actually work? And that's where the problems are going to lie. I don't think it will. Eternia is not a governmental system that he can place himself in. It's a royal family. And it's a royal family of purely good individuals, this is not really the same system that Palpatine was shown taking over before. There is a lot more holes in the government structure that was built in the Star Wars universe that he was able to take advantage of that don't really exist here. He can come in all he wants and pretend to be a good guy and try to sly his way into the Eternia royal family, but it just won't really work. Other than maybe trying to set himself up as being an advisor directly to King Randor, how exactly would he be able to manipulate things? I mean, King Randor already has like 20 different advisors. Very trusted advisors that he goes to whenever he needs anything. He's got He-Man, he's got Tila, he's got Man in Arms. He has so many characters around him that are literally just pure good that anything Sidious says that goes off that goodness path will instantly be able to be seen as kind of fishy. There's only really two paths that Palpatine can take. One being to try and mentally manipulate King Randor by using the force itself to actually manipulate his mind, but it's very unlikely that characters like Man-at-Arms and He-Man will not instantly see this happening when King Randor starts acting very fucking strange and doing shit that they know King Randor would never do. And the second way would be for Palpatine to specifically team up with some of the evil beings that are already here. Basically Skeletor, which I actually think is very possible. Believe or not, Skeletor is actually shown to be extremely open to team-ups with other villains, even villains that Skeletor himself knows want to betray him at some point. Like, Skeletor wants to rule Eternia himself. He wants to be in control of it, and he's not going to share it. But despite that, he's still teamed up with King Hiss, who wanted to also take over Eternia. He's teamed up with Evil Lin, who he knows openly wants to betray him and take over. But he's completely fine with it, and the reason why that is is because Skeletor is a aware that these people are useful to him and can get him the things he needs and he believes that he is powerful enough that they really aren't capable of actually defeating him even if they do try to betray him. Skeletor does have many people under him that are loyal to him but the most powerful people who work with him are not. Hordak who he has worked with several times is not loyal to him. King Hiss is not loyal to him. Evil Lin is not loyal to him and despite that he is okay working with them and I think he'll be perfectly okay with working with Palpatine as well. Him and Palpatine will team up and do whatever the fuck they need to do to go after a 
hernia. Is it gonna work? No, probably not. I mean, if it didn't work teaming up with Lord Hiss, if it didn't work teaming up with Hordak, both of which are more powerful than Palpatine, I don't see how Palpatine's really gonna help much. And anytime Palpatine wants to betray Skeletor, he can, and Skeletor will likely be able to see it coming since he automatically pretty much knows every time someone tries to betray him in the series. But the problem is that Palpatine just isn't really strong enough to actually betray Skeletor. Skeletor's magic and abilities are significantly better than Palpatine's, and physically, it's not even close. Like, when I was talking about Skeletor and the whole Skeletor section, I talk about his magic. I didn't really talk about his physical power, but he is physically strong enough to fight against He-Man, much like all of the other masters of the universe. Skeletor is strong as shit, and his magical abilities outnumber Palpatine's like crazy. No amount of Force Lightning or Force Storm, which, by the way, just to explain, Force Storm is when a dark side user opens up a hole in space-time and can essentially walk through it to teleport, but can also just bring out all manner of force energies, and those force energies just destroy shit. It's just, like, it just fucking wrecks havoc on everything. And these can be opened across whole surfaces of the world. The problem is that that's not really anything that Skeletor can't already do. For one, Skeletor can open up holes in space-time. That's how he arrived to Eternity in the first place. He's a being from another universe. He had to open up a hole in space-time in order to get here. And he's done things like that constantly. Another power that the Sith have that's extremely rare and very difficult to do is the ability to manipulate metachlorians so that they can create life. This is something that Palpatine doesn't know how to do for a long time, but eventually does learn how to do it a little bit. This is another thing that Skeletor can just do casually. He just creates life like it's nothing. It's a very basic ability for him. And that's kind of the way it works if you look at all of Palpatine's abilities. Skeletor can do them on a larger scale and far more casually. The fact of the matter is, is that Palpatine is extremely smart and manipulative and did use that to take over the Star Wars universe. The problem is that the actual takeover itself, he still had to use physical force in order to do. He spent who knows how many years setting up certain pieces in certain places so that when the time came, he can go Order 66, kill off all the Jedi, and then take over. In this particular case, it really doesn't matter how he sets up the pieces. None of his people or he himself is strong enough to kill any of the most powerful characters. He still had to actually overcome them in strength during the takeover which he can't do on Eternia, or Etheria for that matter. His intelligence is only going to bring him so far, much like Skeletor's. Again, because of the Filmation Kids show, a lot of people think that Skeletor is dumb, but if you actually, like, read the lore and the comics and stuff, he's kind of a super genius. I mean, he is a master of all forms of magic, and a multi-dimensional conqueror. He's not stupid. He's just not as physically strong as He-Man, and just because of this, he's not capable of taking over Eternia. Skeletor is an intelligent, scheming type of character who is constantly thwarted by He-Man. Basically, he's just Palpatine on steroids. Sorry to the Star Wars fans, but Palpatine cannot win here. His intelligence will only take him so far. Eventually, he's gonna have to fight, and when he does, he's gonna fucking lose. Next up, we have Thrag from the Invincible series, and a part of me actually feels like Palpatine should be in front of Thrag in this particular scenario. The reason why I didn't is because really when you look at Palpatine's army, the only people who are actually capable of doing anything are Palpatine and Vader, and neither of them are as strong as even the mid-tier Adenian characters. Like, you could take the entire clone army and chuck it at the planet and they're not really going to be able to do anything. The average Eternian is just strong as shit by comparison. I think that Palpatine has a better chance of getting farther through his smarts than Thrax Thrag does. But Thrag has an entire army of Viltrumites who are significantly stronger than any clone trooper. Thrag's army is just so much better than Palpatine's army, I think that alone will allow him to get a little bit farther. However, pretty much everything else character-wise, he's not gonna do particularly well. But pretty much all the things I said that Palpatine will do very well, like the manipulation and the patience and all that, Thrag is essentially the exact opposite. Thrag, unlike Palpatine, will not team up with anyone in Eternia because Thrag is a Viltrumite supremacist that will not lower himself to teaming up with someone who is not a Viltrumite. He will see literally every new person he comes across that isn't a Viltrumite as a lesser being to him. He will not work 
walk on equal grounds with anyone, despite the fact that these characters are significantly stronger than he is. And don't get me wrong, Thrag is strong as shit. Like, he's really powerful, and the average Viltrumite is also very powerful. But the biggest feat that any Viltrumite has ever done is when Thrag, Omni-Man, and Invincible, all three during a fight, flew through this planet's core and blew up the whole planet. It took three Viltrumites struggling together to blow up the planet. Three of the strongest Viltrumites to ever live. And admittedly, it was stated to be a large planet, significantly larger than Earth. Okay, cool. Remember all that shit I just said about Skeletor blowing up multiple planets with one hammer strike? And him not being able to compete with the power of He-Man? Yeah, and just to reiterate, characters like Beast Man, Merman, Moss Man, Misto, and many other characters are capable of fighting on par with He-Man. While not able to beat him, they can challenge him in a fight and do pretty damn well. This is not the case for all Viltrumites. Most Viltrumites do not stand a chance against Thrag. One single Thrag can take on a small army of other Viltrumites. That's how big the gap of power between them are. So what exactly will happen when Thrag and the Viltrumites arrive? to Eternia. Well, they're gonna take it over like they take over all planets, just very straightforward and through physical force. They're gonna go in, they're gonna tell them that the planet's theirs now, and not to resist. Obviously, Eternia and Etheria is going to resist. They're going to attack and very quickly realize that the only people that they're gonna be able to kill are the ground troops. Any master of a universe that they come up against is going to fucking throttle all of them without any trouble. One beast man will very likely defeat Thrag in a fist fight. No joke, this will be the most powerful force the Viltrumites have ever had to fight against, and they are going to be completely kerfuffled at how the fuck this is happening. No joke, many of them are going to have to get over their whole supremacist ideology when they realize that maybe they're not as hot as shit as they thought they were. And the thing is, is that Thrag and his people are arrogant enough to not only attack Eternia, but attack the whole planet at the same time. If he was smart enough and humble enough to come to the conclusion that he might need the help of Skeletor to take take shit over, then maybe he would have a better chance and he could be a really powerful army in assistance to Skeletor. But that's not how Thrag works. Thrag believes that he is superior and his whole race is superior and he's gonna just attack the whole fucking planet. He's gonna create an enemy of both the Eternians and Skeletor and Hordak and she and the Resistance at the same time and very quickly realize that's a bad idea. I mean, I haven't even gone into the magic. Like, Skeletor can literally turn people into other beings, turn them into little rats and shit. And he can do this on a large scale. He can literally, with a gesture of his hand, transform Thrag's entire fucking army into a bunch of little bugs or rats or some shit. And there's nothing Thrag can do about it. That power doesn't exist in the Invincible Universe. Well, that's not true. It does, kind of. That's sort of what Adam Eve does, but she doesn't do it on, like, flesh. She can only do it on objects. Like, they specifically write it into the story that she can't do it on living beings only objects for the sole purpose that it would make her too powerful for the Viltrumites to deal with. Well, no such rule exists for Skeletor or Evil Lynn or Orko or the Sorceress or any of the other insane magic wielders in the world of Eternia and Etheria. Don't get me wrong, it'll be a fun little fight. I mean, they're going to kill a lot of Eternians. The masters of the universe are just so far beyond their capabilities that they're basically just going to hit a fucking straight up wall that they cannot get through. And even even on the weaker soldier units that fight for Eternia and fight for Skeletor, their weapons are good enough that they can actually harm the masters of the universe, so their weaponry is actually powerful enough to hurt the Viltrumites, which is something the Viltrumites are also not really used to. The weapons the Eternians used are forged by the Master of Arms, and his weapons are capable of hurting people like He-Man. So there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that they will be able to 100% kill a Viltrumite. So while Palpatine could get farther if he's smart before hitting a wall, which is physical combat. Thrag and the Viltrumites can actually do physical combat for a little bit, but will still hit that same wall and will likely hit that wall faster than Palpatine will because of lack of patience and humility and ability to work with others. So I, I don't know. I guess you could put these two as sort of equal. They're both going to hit the same wall. Just Palpatine is weaker and Thrag is dumber. So I don't know. These two are kind of interchangeable to me in this list. Next up, we have Frieza from Dragon Ball Z. And I know what you're thinking. What the fuck? 
Frieza should instantly obliterate the whole solar system, if not the whole galaxy, if not the whole universe. Why is he here? Obviously, he's going to dominate He-Man, especially if He-Man's as powerful as you said he was. And yes, I agree with you if we use the version of Frieza from Dragon Ball Super, but we're not going to use the version of Frieza from Dragon Ball Super because that wouldn't be an interesting conversation. It would be far more interesting if we used the Frieza from Dragon Ball Z in the Namek arc. That's the version that's closest in power to the He-Man universe. That's the version that's actually still a planetary conqueror because he's not really much of a conqueror in Super. I mean, he is kind of in Resurrection F, but that sort of goes away and he's basically just on his own. But despite him being significantly more powerful in Dragon Ball Super, his empire is actually at its strongest during the events of Dragon Ball Z. So that is the version we're going to use. Cool? Okay. So how would Frieza do? Wait, do I have to explain Frieza to people? People know Frieza, right? Super powerful, key blasted shit, has multiple different forms. This is not my final form. Blows up planets with little marble sized fucking blasts and shit that turn into really, really big spherical pink things. And then he chucks it and boom, blow. He's, he's a planet destroying conqueror of worlds. That's, that's what, that's his whole thing. He is a very, very cool androgynous alien thing. It's fucking Frieza. So how will he do when he arrives on Eternia? Well, sadly, he has basically the exact same mindset that Thrag does. He's not a supremacist necessarily. I mean, he does think he himself is better than everyone. He's more of an egotist. He's not like a racial supremacist. But he's similar to Thrag in the way that he's just kind of very straightforward with his conquering. He's just gonna show up on the planet and start fucking murdering people and taking over shit by force. It's just sort of what he does. And much like Thrag, he's gonna be very surprised when he realizes that many of his forces are not gonna have the easiest time actually doing this. Like his regular basic bitch forces that he sends down to the planet are gonna start getting wiped out. Like, not easily, don't get me wrong, but they will be able to be harmed by the Eternia weaponry just like Thrag's people were. So he's gonna have to start sending stronger people. That's the Ginyu Force and people like that. And the Ginyu Force are gonna start slaughtering through the regular people, but then they're gonna start getting their asses beat by the Masters of the Universe. Pretty fucking brutally. Frieza is really gonna have to step up himself in order to take over the planet. And how exactly will Frieza do against these characters? Well, how powerful is Frieza? We know he's capable of very casually blowing up planets. Like, way before he's in his final form, he could just blow up a planet with ease. It's not even a problem. But we also know that he's not quite up to solar system level because the series doesn't get to solar system level until Cell. Cell is the first character capable of destroying a solar system in the series. And Cell is easily hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times stronger than Frieza is in the Namek Saga. Like, the power level difference is insane. So we know that he's way below solar system level but very casually destroys planets. So how strong is he? We don't fucking know. All we could say is that he can casually destroy planets and we know he's far beyond that. If we compare that to the characters from the He-Man side, you have characters like She-Ra and He-Man who both also have casual large planetary feats, but that we also don't know what their maximum strength levels are. So for the purposes of this challenge, they're basically equal. I mean, honestly, where can I reasonably put either of them at if none of their maximum powers as far as destruction ability goes has been shown and they've both been shown casually doing the same thing you have to just kind of assume they're around the same level that also kind of goes for speed they both have no issues dodging light speed attacks but they're both not shown to be massively faster than light as we see that despite frieza being able to breathe in space he still has to travel from one planet to another via a spaceship because he's not fast enough to actually get there in a reasonable amount of time on his own. He man doesn't even really travel off world that much, but he has jumped from Eternia to the moon and back in like a split second. And he reacts to light speed attacks like it's nothing. Even on occasions traveling faster than those light speed attacks. So again, they both should kind of be around the same speed. A part of me definitely wants to give the slight edge to Frieza just due to his fighting style being whatever the fuck this shit is. And it's clearly far more aggressive and faster paced than how He-Man fights. So I'll 
I'll give him the edge, but in reality, they've really dodged all the same speed shit and kind of have very similar speed feats. So he gets the edge, but a slight edge. So how exactly would a scenario like this go? Well, pretty simple. Frieza arrives to a new planet, sends his guys down there because for whatever fucking reason, even though Frieza can solve shit instantly, he really likes to give it to his dudes until like the last minute. He's gonna send them down to the planet. They're gonna slaughter some people before some masters of the universe show up and murder them all, which is then gonna have Frieza sending even stronger people and stronger people because again, this is exactly what he did on Planet Namek. He just kept throwing his dudes out there and kind of ignoring the problem until he absolutely had to. And those people are gonna show down, murder some people again. Same shit's gonna happen. They're gonna get wiped out by even stronger masters of the universe until eventually he's gonna have to go down to the planet himself once he realizes that there's people down there strong enough to basically wipe out his entire army. Once he goes down there, he himself will be able to kill most of the masters of the universe. He'll have about as much trouble as He-Man does when it comes to fighting characters like Beast Man, Moss Man, Fisto, etc, etc, which is like, I don't know, like low medium maybe? Like they'll be able to hurt him and they'll be able to react to his attacks, but he'll still just be able to completely overpower them. And using long range key attacks, which is something that almost none of them have, he's really gonna have not too much of a trouble wiping them out. What he's really gonna need to worry about is if he runs into Skeletor or He-Man. In a sort of funny way, I actually think he has more of a chance of beating He-Man than he does beating Skeletor. Because while Skeletor isn't as physically strong as He-Man, the amount of hacks that he has that he can use on Frieza to essentially instantly obliterate him is significant. There's a lot of crazy shit he can do to Frieza. And Frieza is absolutely cocky enough to just give him the time to do it. Like Frieza likes mocking and joking and toying with his enemies. And if he does that shit to Skeletor, who could literally instantly obliterate him, he's gonna be in some serious fucking trouble. On the flip side, if he fights He-Man, now we're gonna have a really good fight. He-Man versus Frieza is actually my favorite fight on this list total because they're so similar in a lot of ways and they both have things that the other doesn't that makes the fight a little bit interesting, right? Frieza can fly. He-Man can't fly. That's gonna give him an advantage. Frieza has key blasts. He-Man doesn't. However, He-Man can deflect and completely negate all key blasts with the power sword. This means that even if Frieza stays far away, flies away, and then starts launching key blasts at him, he can literally deflect them all back at Frieza, and he's fast enough to be able to do it as well. That means it would not be a reliable tactic to actually fight He-Man. He's gonna have to go in close and actually get into a physical battle with them. And as I've said, their physical stats are actually very comparable to one another. So who's gonna win that physical match? And this is the part where I kind of get on the Dragon Ball Z character's nerves. Frieza can't fucking fight. I don't necessarily know why this would get on Dragon Ball Z character's nerves because it's literally stated in the show that he can't. During Frieza and Goku's initial fight on Namek, Goku mocks Frieza for not knowing what he's doing. He even says that Frieza's wasting his time and isn't really worth fighting anymore because of how ignorant in combat he is. In Super, they actually say that Frieza is so powerful because he was just born that way. And the reason he gets so powerful in Super and reaches his golden form is because for the first time in his entire life, he actually started training and he's never done that before. He's not a trained martial artist on Namek. He's just physically more powerful than anyone else he fights against. When he runs into Goku who catches up to his power, it's over. He has no chance whatsoever because Goku is just so such a better fighter than he is. Frieza wins by overcoming his enemies with a massive power advantage. However, he's not gonna have a massive power advantage with He-Man, and unlike Frieza, He-Man is a really skilled fighter. He was trained by Man at Arms, who again, has the ability that any weapon he holds he automatically has peak skill with that ability. Essentially, He-Man is about as skilled with a sword as a person can be because he was trained by a man who is as skilled with a sword as someone possibly can be. In terms of combat prowess, it's not even close. He-Man is significantly better than Frieza. And with their stats being so close, it's not really a match. He-Man's going to win. Maybe Frieza can still pull something out with his ability to fly and again, his really powerful key ability 
income tax, but I seriously doubt that any of that shit's gonna be able to get through He-Man's abilities and that goddamn power sword that can deflect anything that he throws at. I think it's gonna be a really cool fight for like two minutes, but Frieza's gonna very quickly realize that He-Man is just too much for him to deal with. So yeah, Frieza comes closer than Thrag and Palpatine because really when he drops down to Etheria or Eternia, there's only like, I don't know, five people who are actually capable of beating him. You got He-Man, Skeletor, Hordak, She-Ra, and the big ass dragon bitch. And that's really it in the entire universe is capable of fighting against Frieza. Everybody else will be capable of damaging him, but not really putting him down. So good fight, but yeah, He-Man he -Man beats the shit out of Frieza. Last up, but certainly not least, we have Thanos from Marvel Comics. And I feel like I'm about to shatter some religious levels of belief here because surprisingly, Thanos is not as powerful as people think he is. Can you guess what the absolute strongest feat Thanos has ever done is in Marvel Comics without having some kind of insane buff? A lot of people are gonna say, oh, he erased the multiverse or he defeated the Living Tribunal or he defeated Eternity or some ridiculous overpowered shit. No, it's not. His strongest feat is clashing with Drax the Destroyer and their clash matched one another and destroyed the entire planet. It's his absolute strongest physical feat without having any sort of buffs. Now, he's been stronger than that and has stronger abilities than that, like he has destroyed a planet on his own with a power-up. He's erased the universe with a power-up. He defeated the Living Tribunal with a power-up. Again, it's all power-ups. Thanos himself is not nearly as strong as people give him credit for. And his strength throughout the comics without those power-ups is pretty consistent. Basically, he's stronger than characters like Thor, weaker than characters like Sentry, and stronger than Savage Hulk, but if he fights for too long, Hulk will surpass his strength. In fact, Thanos himself has actually stayed on more than one occasion that he doesn't like fighting Hulk because he knows he has to beat him really quickly because if the fight goes on for too long, Hulk will eventually overpower him. Yes, it may be a surprise to most people, but Testicle Chin is actually not as strong physically as Frieza is. In terms of physicals, Frieza would outdo Thanos. Yeah, 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 Thanos overpowered Thor. Who gives a shit? A lot of people's overpowered Thor. Hercules, Sentry, Hulk, so many characters overpowered Thor. Thor is also a character that's wanked to hell. Y'all are aware that Thor has multiple items that increase his strength past what its normal strength is, right? Like his belt of strength actually increases his strength like a hundredfold or something. I forgot the exact number. And then Mjolnir itself increases his strength. At one point in the comics during a fight with Gore the God Butcher, Thor did destroy an entire planet with just the shockwave of one of his strikes. That's true. But the part that people tend to forget is that he shattered the bones in his arm to do that. Thor is bitch moded most of the time by planet destroying beings. Under normal circumstances, he's not a planet destroyer. It takes all of his might in order to do that. And that's with all these items that enhance his strength. Characters like Hulk and Sentry do not have that problem. But because Thanos is technically weaker than Frieza, that means he should lose, right? He should be below Frieza. Why is he not higher than Frieza? No, he's, he's, he's higher than Frieza. Because his physical power is not the thing that makes him so dangerous. So if you watch the MCU version of Thanos, you kind of see Thanos as just like this big, strong purple dude who has a gauntlet that someone else made for him and then finds a bunch of stones that he knew about. He just finds shit. And then you like all his power is borrowed and he himself isn't really all of that like great. You know, and that's actually not true. In the comics, Thanos is a top tier warrior. He is a mage nearly unmatched by anyone else in the universe. And he is a master of science and technology to the point that he can build pretty much anything. Essentially, if Thanos wants to do something, he has enough knowledge in either science or magic to figure out how to do it. This is what makes him so powerful. In the Marvel Universe, there are three characters that are stated to be good enough at magic to become the source or Supreme. The obvious one is Doctor Strange. The other two is Doctor Doom and Thanos. Those are the three greatest magic users in the entire Marvel Universe in the comics. You would never know that by watching the MCU because Thanos at no point uses any form of magic. In the MCU, Thanos forces Tyrion Lannister to create the Infinity Gauntlet for him so that he can wield the stones at the same time. But in the comics, Thanos is a super genius that can build any sort of technology that he wants on his own 
own. He himself invents the gauntlet that allows him to utilize the gem's power, which is something that no one else in the universe is capable of doing. No one knows how to utilize their power like that. Thanos figures it out and builds a device that can. That's why the Infinity Gauntlet is his weapon, and there aren't like a bunch of Infinity Gauntlets. Pretty much the mass majority of Thanos' powers comes from his ability to create items and utilize items to enhance his already impressive abilities. And this is where it's doing it kind of hard to really talk about exactly how well he's going to do in the He-Man universe, because he's very similar to characters that already exist within He-Man. If I had to describe Thanos' character in terms of He-Man, I would say he's basically Hordak on steroids with the personality of Skeletor and the resistances of He-Man. I said earlier in the video that Skeletor has an S rank in magic, whereas Hordak has like a B plus to an A minus in technology and magic. Well, Thanos has an S rank in both magic and technology. I wouldn't necessarily say that his ability in magic is quite as good as Skeletor's because Skeletor doesn't need any items to do it. He just does what he does. And oftentimes it's shown that Thanos actually does need a lot of items or to create shit so that he can do the things that he does. But basically anything Thanos wants to do, he can do it. He is capable of creating any item that he really wants to, to virtually do anything that he wants to do. On top of that, his resistances are insane. He has completely resisted pretty much every form of mind manipulation, soul manipulation, biological manipulation, powers that are trying to fuck with him via space time and reality warping and all sorts of different things. He's shown some kind of resistance towards pretty much all of it. Thanos without any items whatsoever would be incredibly difficult to kill, just in general. But the thing that's going to make him the most dangerous in terms of the He-Man universe is his ability to utilize the magics of whatever universe he's in in order to make himself as powerful as humanly possible. Now, I'm not giving him things like the heart of the universe because that's not his weapon. It's something that he had to go out of his way to obtain in one storyline, and he has it for one storyline, and then he loses it. And this is the case for a lot of his stuff. I'm only going to give him his technology that he himself created. But that doesn't mean that he can't create new stuff and he can't utilize the magics that exist within the He-Man universe, which there are a lot of. Thanos has been able to steal power from godlike beings to utilize magic from things that people aren't even aware that you can do that for. There are tons and tons of massively powerful artifacts, places of power, beings, godlike beings that have all sorts of different magics that Thanos will be able to utilize, create something to steal that power for himself and make himself vastly more powerful. Things like the Star Seed, like Castle Grayskull, like the Sorceress, characters that have insane levels of power. He will come to this universe, understand it relatively quickly, and then utilize it to make himself stronger. And this is what makes this shit so goddamn hard, because Skeletor does the exact same shit. Skeletor has utilized the power of the Sword of Power, Castle Grayskull, the Sorceress, the Star Seed, and pretty much every other thing he possibly can. I didn't realize this when I picked Thanos on this list, but he and Skeletor are very, very similar characters. They are both mortals that are essentially death gods that use insane levels of power they find within the universe they exist in to increase their power to greater lengths so that they can cause as many deaths and horrors as humanly possible across the entire multiverse. This is why I think Attorney is fucked. Because they're so incredibly similar and want so many of the exact same things, I don't see a reality where Skeletor and Thanos don't team up. There's no way they won't. And basically what you'll be doing is having a second Skeletor to go after Eternia. Skeletor is such a massive threat to Eternia that he's almost wiped it out entirely on several occasions by himself. I understand the cartoons make it kind of jokey and like every episode he gets repelled. That's not how it works in the comics and that's not how it works in the lore. In the lore, he's a massive fucking threat and Eternia oftentimes is just barely being able to survive him. Having Thanos show up on Eternia is going to double that fucking threat level. I just have a very hard time believing that both Eternia and Etheria will be able to fight against a combined force that is Skeletor, King Hiss, Hordak, and Thanos. So how exactly do I think this is going to go down? Well, you have two scheming super geniuses who are masters at magic, as well as Thanos being a master of technology, teaming up to bring all of their power against Eternia. While He-Man is physically stronger than both of those characters, I do think this is going to be too much for him to deal with, especially if Skeletor explains to Thanos exactly how the sort of power works. In Marvel Comics, there have been multiple instances where Thanos has understood how magical items that heroes use work so that he can then develop something that specifically fights against that item. For instance, he once took away all of the power that Mjolnir had in a fight with Thor. Thor threw the hammer at Thanos and he developed a technology that could literally stop it 
it midair and take all the fucking magic out of it. It's very possible that he could do something similar to the Sword of Power. Now, the Sword of Power has shown resistances to having its power taken from it. So maybe it's possible that, that won't be the case and Thanos won't be able to figure it out. But generally speaking, like I said before, Thanos can figure out pretty much anything that he needs to. And there really isn't any character that exists within He-Man with Thanos's level of technological advancement. And then after Eternia Falls, which I give it like maybe a six or seven out of 10 that it will, the story will then change because Thanos is still gonna wanna wipe out all life in this universe and Skeletor is still gonna wanna take it over. So this is gonna cause an issue between these two characters and they're going to fight each other. Now I don't think Thanos is stupid enough to not be aware that this is an inevitability and Skeletor for sure is gonna know this is an inevitability because it's something he's always aware of with all of his underlings. And then you're gonna have a massive Skeletor versus Thanos fight. And this one I honestly give like a 50-50 shot because there's no way that they both aren't going to be preparing for this inevitability once Attorney of Falls. Who actually wins this engagement is entirely up in the air. It's really just about who will outsmart who. And considering they're both schemers, they're both geniuses, and they're both masters of their field, you can literally flip a fucking coin. I give it a 50-50 on who's gonna win. I will say that I'm leaning towards Skeletor just a little bit because his general base power is just considerably higher than Thanos's. Like, casually, without even trying, destroying planets all across the universe is considerably higher than anything we've seen base Thanos do. But Thanos's ability to increase in power through his technology may counterbalance this yeah no this this is a hard one I'm, I'm gonna let you guys talk about this one down in the comments i'm gonna read what you guys say because this could really go either way this is another one of those really cool fights that i like kind of like the chainsaw man versus hellboy fight thanos versus skeletor is a really fucking cool fight i may make a video about this in the future this this is pretty badass not gonna lie but that's gonna be it for today hope you enjoyed the video if you did make sure to like subscribe comment share and join the membership if you join the membership you will get videos early and always remember y'all stay safe out there you hear